so we spoke in the, in the opening about hills and about hills that for some of us are incredibly difficult or we might be new to. And for some of us, we've been up many, many times before. Communicating is for me a hard hill to climb in, in any sense of the word, but specifically public speaking is a hard hill for me and was one that I think through my youth, I was pretty turned off by. I, was, I wasn't really gonna do a lot of. Um, I had that in the plans, had that in the cards. And then uh, a friend told me about a course he had taken senior year at Brown called Persuasive Communication and how it wasn't just about speaking, it was really about how we communicate in, in all areas of life. And so I eagerly signed up for the course, realized to get into it, I had to have been on a wait list about two years ago. It was so competitive. Somehow managed to weasel my way into it. Um, and, and through that course, really became significantly more confident at speaking and, and would say is probably the biggest reason I'm here today. And I have the distinct privilege, yeah, we can clap. <laughs> I have the distinct privilege to introduce our first keynote speaker is the professor of that course. Communication is a hill she has been up so many times before. I just learned um, for over 50 years she's been teaching persuasive communication. She is a distinguished senior lecturer at Brown University. It's my privilege to introduce Barbara Tannenbaum. Thank you, Gemma. You can see how well she did in the class. Yes, another round of applause. I came to Brown for a one-year appointment. It's been a heck of a year. <laughs> but it's students like that who keep me doing it. I always say when my own kids are not around, it's like the best part of parenting without any of the mess. So it works. So my goal with you this afternoon is quite simple. It's to change your lives. Now, I know it's a big goal, and I don't have a whole semester, but my prediction is that after our time together, you will think about communication in a different and more strategic way, because communication matters. You are all, and I got to meet some of you last night, you're bright, you're knowledgeable. I wish that were enough. Because if it were only about knowledge, the whole country would be vaccinated. It's not only about the knowledge, it's about how the knowledge is conveyed. So I want to share with you some more tools for your toolbox or paints for your paint box or whatever way you want to use these strategies. Most people assume that we are making communication choices about the way that we communicate. So if the presumption is we're doing this actively, why not choose actively the best way to influence our audience, an audience can be one other person, to get done what we need to get done. And I don't just mean job-wise here. I mean the things that we need to do. Uh, we may not all agree politically, but we've got a dangerous announcement coming tonight. Yeah, I think you all know what I mean. And what I want to do is look at what we can learn from this kind of communication, all kinds of communication. To know that for some of you, I may be asking you to be bilingual, to speak power talk and confidence in a way that you might not always feel it. And to use that tool when and if you want to, but know that it doesn't make you any better or it's not the only way to communicate. But the goal is to give you strategies that you can use immediately to think about your communication. And my prediction is that after our time together, you will start watching and listening to people's communication in a different way and ultimately start thinking of your own communication in a different way. And so we don't have a lot of time together. There's so much I want to cover. So let's continue. All speaking is public speaking. All speaking is public speaking. So even if you have one other person, it's a public. And sometimes you have unintentional publics. People overhear you. If you talk to yourself, well, I don't know. It's not really public unless you keep answering yourself and other people think it's public. But all speaking is public speaking. Why the repetition? 
because learning theorists tell us in order to remember an idea, I need to hear it between two and four times. Fewer than twice I forget, more than four times I start getting annoyed. So that old newspaper adage, some of us still remember newspapers, yeah? Mm -hmm. The old tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. That three goes right down the middle. Why is this important? Because we forget so much of what we hear. Generally, depending on the study, we forget between 65 and 80% of what we hear almost immediately. So I will be grateful two weeks from now if you start using some of the things that we're gonna highlight for you in my presentation today. So how else can I increase retention? Visuals can increase retention. And there are data that show that the more senses that you use in learning the message, the better learned the message is. So if you just hear it, you forget more. If you hear it and see it, it's better. If you hear it, see it, and say it, and ultimately teach it to someone else, then you've got it. So sensory, involvement, those kinds of things. And in terms of thinking this as public speaking, I want you to think of this as a conversation and not a performance. That's what makes a successful presentation, be it one person on Zoom, on the phone, Twitter, whatever it is. That all speaking is public speaking, I wanna highlight for two more reasons. The first reason is that the general strategies that I'll share with you will go cross audience and cross situation. Yes, because I'm up here today and there's a videographer, I need a microphone. But I still need to ask myself the same questions and answers in anticipation that I would if I were talking in an interview, that I would if I were talking to the media. So generally being able to share those tips and tricks. The um, uh, um, uh, I'm fine. The um, er, uh, uh, second reason that I say that all speaking is public speaking is that that means that the um, er, uh, uh, bad habits that we have, we have all the time. I don't suddenly acquire them when I get up here, but my fear might exacerbate them a little. But my tip is this. We can start on this journey together today. I want you to find a coach or several coaches, people you hang out with, people you talk to on the phone, friends, colleagues at work, whoever they might be. And if I uncover a behavior that you say, gee, I'd like to work on that, then you might tell the coach. Because if you studied psychology, you might recall that intermittently reinforced patterns are the hardest to extinguish. Translation, please. If sometimes I uh and um and I'm stopped, sometimes I uh and um and I'm not, it will take me longer to rid myself of the behavior than if I'm stopped each and every time. So frequency of interrupting the old behavior will accelerate the behavioral change. So I said before there are ways of reinforcing to make sure that people remember. I highlighted repetition. I highlighted visual or other kinds of aids. Let me highlight two more. Humor will increase retention. We remember funny stories. Not always fun to make fun of things, but humor can be dangerous, so we need to be careful with it. Sarcasm doesn't work because audiences often don't know you well enough to know are you being serious or is that person sarcastic? We can get into big trouble that way. I've done it. So, yes, right. I, I will tell the story at some later time if there is time. But I, I thought everyone knew my political views and wouldn't twist them backwards. But I've learned that that's easy to do. But the last thing that I want to do is what I call verbal highlighting. And verbal highlighting is if I had a textbook, even at a distance, you could tell where the most important ideas are. There would be boldface and chapter heads and enumeration and illustration. But when we talk, we don't have those markers. So I'm sure you've heard many speakers, and if someone said, I sat next to the, pres the former president of Brown University who was Varjan Gregorian, thought to be very eloquent, and he used big words and long sentences, and the person next to me said after about 45 minutes, wow, that was such a wonderful speech. And I said, can you tell me the main point? And he said, well, 
and he paused long enough that he realized he couldn't, and I certainly realized the same thing. So for me, again, I want to highlight what's most important. This is verbal highlighting, and here it is. If you remember one thing from my talk with you today, we're coming up to it. And it isn't even mine. It belongs to an old white guy named Aristotle. And, <laughs> yeah. and Aristotle says, whenever we communicate, and this can be on the phone, on Zoom, on Teams, which is another challenge, on WebEx, or whatever way you're communicating, Slack, there are two things we're always trying to balance. Number one, what's my goal? And number two, who's my audience? So all communication is goal-oriented and audience-centered. Goal-oriented and audience-centered. Now I want to ask a real question. Which do you think is harder to change, your goal or your audience? What do you think? Audience. Does anyone want to say why? You don't have much control. And so the metaphor, you'll find out I like talking in metaphors and analogies that I use here is the audience is the hand we're dealt. We can think strategically about how to play out the hand, but rarely do we get to throw in the cards and say, you know, I'd like a new audience. This boss, nah, 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 I'd like a new boss. This interviewer doesn't seem to like me. Could I have a new one? Yes. So it's important to think always about what's my goal for this audience. If I'm expecting a phone call at 3 in the afternoon, I will admit I don't pick it up on the first ring. I get it on the second ring, don't want to be rude. But that first ring is, again, what's my goal and who's my audience? Is my goal to apologize? Is my goal to get business? Is my goal to clarify something? Is my goal to set up a meeting? So it helps me always to think about strategic ways of thinking about my communication. Well, Aristotle was great, and even greatness can be added to, and hence the Tannenbaum corollary to the Aristotelian observation, which is that means we need to talk to our audience in values and beliefs. And here's the tricky part, values and beliefs that are most important to them. And here is the one that's going to make me sound as if I have no ethical backbone. Gemma will tell you I do. They may or may not be the most important values to me. It's about what's most important to the audience. Now, I know you're thinking, will she pander to the audience, tell them anything that they want to know? No, absolutely not. But I cannot, and this is part of the problem now, and it's worldwide, right? We don't come together. It's, I have my values and beliefs, you have yours, and until somebody moves, we're not going to make much progress. So I need to understand how to reach out to you with your values and beliefs. Let me give you an example. For many years, I was asked, and I know that I teach at Brown, that gender is not a binary. But my task was to put more women on boards of directors for large corporations. And so I tried. For me, diversity, inclusivity, fairness are values that I've lived my life on, and we can talk about all of those. I've had a lot of many years and a lot of many experiences in many different movements to add to that credibility. But those board people had heard those arguments, and now, okay, we have DEI and it's a password and whatever, but I don't know that we get better results. Let's just be honest about that. But at any rate, so I would make these arguments, and it was a tough, tough argument to make. Once I had data that boards with women on them did better financially, it was an easy suggestion to the bankers, yes? Now, I'm not saying that I am against them making more money if they have more diverse boards. But I am saying that is not my top value. My top values were not theirs. So I had to find a place where my values could accept or reach out or connect with their values in a way that would make that argument real to them. And that's thinking hard about this. Now, something that my undergraduates don't often get, or the metaphor I like to use here, the difference between compromise and being compromised. And they're young. Some of them have experienced this. Or the metaphor I also made up is, how far will I go to change the key of my song 
so more people can hear it versus at what point am I now singing somebody else's song? So can I found out when I talked to Brown alumni groups, the more conservatively I dress, the more radical I can be in what I say and have it be accepted, yes? <laughs> I used to train police officers in Rhode Island about how to question people who had been sexually assaulted. And I found that I got a whole different reception if I did two things. Number one, I wore a skirt. Whoa, yes, but I will tell you the questions that I got wasn't that, oh, she's one of them, she hates me, and on and on. I got a different reception. The second thing was I used Dr. Barbara Tannenbaum. Why? Because every person in that precinct had a rank. It was Sergeant this and Detective that and Lieutenant this, and I worked hard for that doctorate. At Brown, we don't say doctor. Everyone would think I'm an MD. It's true. Now, you pay the price of admission, and then you don't want to talk about it, yeah? Mm -hmm. But the questions Dr. Tannenbaum got from the police officers were so much more respectful than Marta, the other volunteer from the center. So I've learned that I'm not losing anything by using my title if I need to to help other people. Should I need to wear a skirt to get better treatment for rape survivors in the state of Rhode Island? No. Would I do it now, in the middle of winter? No, <laughs> right? But it started a different kind of conversation. So we need to think about always finding people where they are and thinking always about our audience. And inclusivity matters. So now I want to ask you a real question, and maybe ask for a hand show. Has there ever been a time when you, as an audience member, have not felt included by a speaker? That's most of us, if not almost all of us. And that happens so often, and there's no reason for it. It means that the audience, that the speaker, has not thought lovingly, inclusively, who the audience is. And thinking about your audience is so important. Let me quote from none other than the Harvard Business Review, but you'll like the quote. Designing a presentation without an audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern. <laughs> Told you you'd like the quote. OK. So who is the audience, and how do I research them? I start with websites if they have them. I got asked by Gemma. I asked, what about the audience? What's the main way that people are communicating? I got asked to come to a speaker's event last night where I got to meet people and ask them, what do you want to hear? So that I can constantly revise and target. Because the speech doesn't exist here. It exists here as a conversation. It should always be fresh. It should always be different. And it should always be tailored to your audience. So one of the ways in which we need to think inclusively is about culture. So can anyone give me an example of a communication mishap, if you will, because of culture? Anyone? No. Please, louder. So can you, do I need to repeat it? Yes. Or can you come up here and I'll share my mic? <laughs> oh, you can use this mic, sorry. Chevy introduced the Nova in Latin America. Yes, thank you. Nova in Latin America means doesn't go. <laughs> Not clever, yes. Bad advertising campaign. Any others? Yes, please. <laughs> OK, so for the videographer, Canadians apologize when sending random messages. <laughs> yes. And again, I know gender is not a binary, but I will tell you, growing up as I did as a woman, I was taught to apologize for everything. And here, public confession, I have walked into inanimate objects, and I have indeed apologized to them. <laughs> that laughter is identification. That's the frightening part. It has not yet gone away. When my students apologize, I say, don't apologize. What's their next words? I'm sorry I apologized. <laughs> Endless hall of mirrors, yes? How do we get out of it? Apologize for what you've done wrong. We, again, might not agree politically, but I think it took Hillary too long to apologize about those emails. So it kept becoming an issue. It kept being an issue. Just say, OK, I did it. I learned. Other people have done it. We're past it. I'm sorry. 
But no, it kept being an issue. So I'm not saying don't apologize, but when it's real rather than, there's a wonderful book, I don't like the fight metaphor, called The Feminist Fights Book. And it, it's got a big circle and it says, number of times I apologized, and a very small portion of that circle is number of times I really meant it. So <laughs> we'll take it from there. Absolutely. I, do, I did work in India, and I read four books on doing work in India before I went over, and I thought, okay, I'm prepared. But what nobody told me is that the culture was so polite that people would not say no. So I learned that I will try means it will never happen. <laughs> it will never happen. And I got into an uncomfortable position. I was working for a family named Ambani when I was there. If you are from India, you would know the name. And I invited Nita and family. They were visiting in the U.S. over for dinner. And uh, she said, I will try. And in the U.S., I will try means likely to happen. And now it's the day of the dinner. Do I cook for one family or two? Forced her to the no. I would not do that again. I did a project with USAID designing work for women business owners in southern Africa, in Botswana and Namibia. And uh, these are women who owned agribusiness, mining business, craft business, and how to get bank loans. They had to be more assertive to do this. And then they asked me to redesign the two-day workshop as a three-day workshop and include Zambia as well. And what we found in doing the research is, before we went over there, thank God, that the more assertive the women got, the more violence was done to them at home. So we always need to think about culture when we think about communication. Now you probably noticed what I did here was I blanked it, but this was supposed to be an elegant and now you can see it, yes. <laughs> and gender matters too, and we all know what this is. We, the most recent figure I could find was in the US that 1.7 million people identified as trans, we have people who forget that some terms feel gendered even if they're not intended to be like you guys. I've turned to the southern y'all, or we all is even better when we're talking. Include yourself if you are a member of the group. Not the royal we, the nurse who comes into the room and the hospital room says, and how are we feeling today? Eh, it's not about us, I'm feeling like crap, <laughs> yes? But I used to say women, they, and I realized I still identify as one, cisgendered as I might be, but it's women, we. And I work at Wellesley, and the way that Wellesley thinks about women is anyone who decides that she is a woman is indeed a woman. We could have that discussion at another time, I suspect, as well. But I was first turned down. I was in Penn Station, and I was in a hurry. And so I get to the restroom, and there's a long line out the women's room. And then there's one stall, and it's labeled all gender. So I figured, great, I'll get there before the train. There's a guard, and she stops me, and she says, you can't use that room. And I said, all gender. And she goes, I said, all gender. And she goes, no. And she said, you're not trans. And first of all, how do you know, really? Okay, you know, but second of all, well then relabel, please, because all to me is all encompassing, but that we can continue to talk about at another time as well. But what I want to talk to you about here, and I promise the only acronym of our time together is the WUFM, and it stands for what's in it for me, me being your audience. What's in it for me? So there are two things you want to do at the beginning of any presentation. A presentation could be presenting an idea at a meeting. Again, it doesn't have to be a formal public speaking event. Number one, establish your credibility. And I have a slide a little bit later on credibility. How do you know what you know? I was lucky enough to have Gemma do a really touching, beautiful, she got teary, I got teary, we all, you know, whatever. But, um, but there are data that say it is better to have someone else introduce you than to introduce yourself. You are more believable, if you will. And if you, like me, love Jenna and think, Gemma and think that she is able to uh, have some authority, then she can pass her credibility on to me. 
Also, it's hard for some of us to brag. You know, I'm really good at this, and I won this award, and all of that. And sometimes this gets us down in interviews. When I was working at Wellesley one January, I worked there every January, one of the deans said, these women are so bright, Barbara, but they can't self-promote in interviews. So here's what I came up with for the Wellesley women. I now use it for everyone. If you have trouble selling yourself, sell yourself as if you're selling your best friend. That would be easy. That would be easy. And realize you're their best friend, too. So you could say the same thing. Every year at Brown, we have to do not only our CV updates of all the things we've done, but a letter of accomplishments. Like, then why are you having me do the CV? Read it yourself. But OK. So one of my good friends whom I hired, and uh, I love the way things go. She's now my sister-in-law. But at any rate, um, who says you can't choose family? At any rate. <laughs> So she and I would always read each other's letters and say, you need to be stronger about your accomplishment here. You need to be stronger about your accomplishment there. So if you don't trust yourself, get another set of eyes on it. That will help, too. So the second thing you want to do is the what's in it for me. And remember, I said this will change your perspective on communication. This will give you some ideas that you can put to use almost immediately. And another way to think about the what's in it for me and the credibility is the two questions you're answering at the beginning of any presentation. How do you know? That's the credibility piece. And why should I care? And if you can get audiences or one other person as an audience to care, then you've made a huge step in terms of that connection. Now, here I want to borrow a term from the field of advertising. Advertising makes a difference in the way that they talk about features versus benefits. The feature is my car has snow tires. The benefit is it will get me up College Hill in the winter. When we talk to people about ideas, we need to talk to them in benefits and not just features. Often when we sell something, here's a list of 10 reasons why. We are judged by our weakest reason. And once someone says, oh, that one doesn't make any sense, suddenly our credibility on all of the others is more suspect. So find, we don't need 10 reasons to buy. We need one compelling reason. And yes, if you think that we have variety in the audience, maybe I need more than one, because what might work for you might not work for you. But features turning them into benefits, and two things from the beginning. Now I want to turn to something that's quite different. When we present in person or even video uh, with, with uh, with doing it Zoom or whatever. How is that communication evaluated? Oh, first there's an example of the what's in it for me. New York City subway, took the shot myself. They used to ask you not to throw trash in the city subways. Why? Because don't throw trash, have pride in your city. Well, if you've lived in New York City or any of the suburbs, you know that pride in your city is not a big motivator <laughs> for the people who are throwing trash in the subways. So this was a more recent effect. Throwing trash is dangerous. It causes track fires. Illegal, you could get caught, and causes major delays if there is one of those track fires. Someone finally got the what's in it for me. Now, in Washington, D.C., they didn't want trash in their subways either. And so for a short period of time, they read the fo following public service announcement. Do not throw trash. We don't want rats like they have in New York City. <laughs> so now we are going to something that's rather different. When we present, and here's how this stacks up, the most important thing for most audiences, like it or not, is the visual. Then the vocal and then the message. But the message is the part we all obsess about. Now, this shifts. And the reason I'm not giving you the numbers, this was started by Moravian's work a while, a long time ago in UCLA, is because it shifts with your different audiences. And that's the part he didn't really account for at that time. That yes, if I'm at an academic conference, I can look great and sound great. And if I've got crappy data, I've still got crappy data. And I will get pinned to the wall for it, yes? So, and that's as it should be, I hope. Yes, messages should still matter. But I want to talk to you about how to maximize the visual and the vocal, because I'm assuming that you all know what you're doing, because the people I talked to last night sure knew a lot more about what you do than I do. So, so let's think about the visual and the vocal. Now, 
let me talk about an experiment that was done by uh, a woman who's now deceased recently, Ambadi is her last name, and when she did this study, she was out of the nonverbal center at Harvard. And what she did was she showed subjects, videos of people teaching. In this particular case, they were grad TAs. And they either got three 20-second exposures, three 10-second exposures, or three five-second exposures. So from a full minute to about 15 seconds. And then she passed out something that looked rather like a course evaluation. How good a teacher is this teacher? How well organized is this teacher? All of those kinds of things. She got virtually no statistically significant difference among groups who had seen as much as a minute to as few as three different samples of five seconds each. OK, so what does this tell us? Two things to note. Number one, she showed the video with the sound turned off. This was totally on the visual. But number two, and here's the kicker, there was, she then compared those results to other results of students who had actually taken the whole semester with these particular TAs, and again, the results were virtually identical. There is something in 15 seconds that speaks to competence as a teacher, to confidence that you should have in me, and all of those kinds of things. If I had come in and said, today I want to talk to you about how to be a, a, a good speaker, not so credible, yes? But there is a shy girl hiding in here. I was the girl whose reports all came home, report cards came home from uh, school. Ideal student, but quiet. Quiet, quiet. I started full time on the faculty when I was 22. It was that one year appointment. And I told my parents I was going to be doing it. And they said, you, Bobby, you're going to get up and talk I in front of people? I thought, no wonder I have no self-confidence about this. <laughs> so if I can make the transformation, any of you can. So let's think about the visual. I know that a lot of what you do is online, and whether it's Zoom or whatever, I wanted to use some photos to illustrate some do's and don'ts. So OK, well, there we have, if you turn your head completely to a right angle, you will see the office. And the office has a ring light, because lighting is so important. And it has an arm that you can see, so I can bring my notes across. And those are the two main things. So you want to think about lighting. And I'll show you an illustration of somebody who didn't, who was published in a Brown publication. And the best way to think about this is take your phone, put it on so it mirrors you, and then find where there are the fewest shadows. But what you want to make sure, and we'll see it in a minute, and where to focus your gaze, you want to look at the camera. Some of us like to look at the people, but that is not looking at them. That is looking down, usually. And what you want to do is put a sticky note, put, I have books under my computer so that my camera and I can, I have an, an outside camera. Uh, my son is a gamer and told me the best kind of camera and with a special little ring light and what to do. But here are some not to do's. Backlighting. <laughs> This is the one that was in a brown entrepreneurship newsletter. And I will also tell you that the darker your skin, the harsher this effect is in terms of blocking you out. Reflection, those of us who wear glasses. And even if you've had them coated, as I have, in the non-reflective, you still, with the ring light, sometimes get those points of light. And this next one, my favorite ballerina, we're looking up her nose. Yes, I have a colleague, and we look up his nose, and I, he's on the faculty, and I told him, and he's, we're still looking up his nose. <laughs> yeah, and then finally, my son, the gamer, who loves different backgrounds, yes. And so a couple of issues. First of all, there's the background. Second of all, there's the glasses. But also, if you're wearing something with small writing, people are going to want to read the writing and it gets to be a distraction. I will admit to sometimes when people are in front of their library, I want to see what the books are behind them. So reduce distractions, and that will be a theme for sure. So, well, let me stop. So, and here's a trick I want to teach you, and that is the blanking function on a remote. That immediately the focus goes from the slide back to me. Now, you probably know this. It's not a big investment to have a clicker. But if you don't have a clicker, you may or may not know, and this works if you are in a variety of things, keynote or whatever, you need to be in slideshow. But if I hit the letter key B, it will blank the slide. It is a toggle. If I hit it again, it will retrieve the slide.
If it's four in the afternoon and everyone is starting to doze off, I hit the W and white out. Yes, in a small room it works really well to wake everybody up. And again, it's a toggle. But here I want you to learn from my mistake. So what was my mistake? I was asked to do a three hour presentation for the global legal team at Chanel in Paris. What do I wear? Really? <laughs> really? But I figured black. Black worked. I walked into a sea of black. And also, something that you might want to know about black, when we test black as a color, generally the darker the color you wear, the more powerful you are seen to be. Now again, the guy who's going to make the announcement tonight is always in the darkest suit in the room. This is not an accident, yes? It exudes power. Power sells confidence cells, and in a terrifying study that is quoted in a book called The Confidence Code, a book that talks about my work among others. And they quote a different study saying, and this is horrifying, especially for an academic, for most audiences, confidence is more important than competence. Confidence more important than competence. Please don't give up competence. Please, you will break our hearts as academics, among others. But you need to, if you don't have the confidence, fake it till you make it. That's Amy's work. You may know Amy Cuddy's work. I had a chance to do a tandem presentation with Amy at the Harvard Faculty Club. I know she's under attack. Please talk to me about that if you want to. Um, I, Certain researchers get attacked in ways that other researchers don't, and we could have that conversation. And if you look at who's attacked and all of that kind of thing. And when I was disappointed because the attack, a lot of it was we can't replicate the results to the same level of significance. And all right, full disclosure, I was working at a pharmaceutical. Uh, yeah, but the two of them are doing great with vaccines, so they do some good, yeah. But at any rate, um, I mentioned this, and one of the scientists said, Barbara, that's, that's half of at least of scientific research cannot be replicated to the same level of significance. And he was doing cancer research, so that frightened me. And then I worked at another institution where the head of research showed me the article that it's closer to 70%. So who we say and who we pick on, but faking it till you make it. The image, and again, we don't have to agree on this, that I have of Trump, whenever he is attacked, I have the image of a puffer fish, yeah? The more they're attacked, the bigger they get. And it seems to work for him. Yes, the dark suit, the red tie, that's all been studied. Even Obama, his ties were sort of red-purple, but there was still a reddish tone base to it. Why? Because it tests. And so all of this, juries are now done by focus groups and how we want to pick juries. It's, a lot of this is based on that visual. But there I am at Chanel, and I'm doing my speech, and I want to to blank the slide, and I hit the letter key B, and instead of a blackout, lo and behold, I get a whiteout. And I think, huh. So I do it again, same thing happens. To my huge embarrassment, from the back of the room, one of the lawyers yells out, hit the N, and as soon as he said that, having been a French minor in college, blanc and noir, right? So the, the blanking thing, if you are in another country, if you are using someone else's computer, please do not be the ugly American as I was. Please think about what it would be ahead of time. So let's, let's how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing okay on time. Well, okay. Are you up for, why doesn't everyone, if you can, please stand. And let's talk about the best posture for standing and delivering if you want to. And this also works, I had someone who needed to confront her boss and I said, well, just stand up, you're taller than he is. And she, she went in there and felt so much empowered with that idea that she could stand. But at any rate, this is what's been studied. People do study the most specific things in my, in my discipline. Generally feet about shoulder width distance apart. Whereas some of us have been taught not to take up any space and we do this, or we speak from legs crossed, I have to pee position. I have worked with some people who speak from fifth position ballet. <laughs> yes. So a good, yeah, but if you had the same mom I did, it was always Barbara, <clears throat> which always meant seated or standing, put your legs together because someone will come out from peak and I don't know. <laughs> there was just this whole, I don't know. 
And, but I, I saw this happen at the Providence train station not very long ago. There's was a little girl, she was probably about six, and she's in corduroy pants, and she's sitting splayed on this bench, and her mom says, put your legs together. And I thought, there, it's still happening. There we are. Okay, so why this? I spoke at a conference of photojournalists. They said they all stand this way. Because why? They get out the camera at the scene of the crime. They don't have time to set up a tripod, but they need to be steady. And I thought, why wouldn't we always want to be that stage. So I think of it as a tripod stance. You don't have to lock your knees. And I practice this just as I said, find a monitor. Give yourself a pass when you're doing a real presentation, but think about this other stuff when it's less consequential. Okay, so now we got the stance. Now the head. Some of us tilt our heads. If you don't know what your posture really looks like, look at old photos. They won't lie. This is submissive. When dogs do this, they're surrendering. But many of us have been taught to, yeah, and then nod and smile. And, you know, I'm not going to be one of those speakers. I can be one of these speakers, yeah. So heads on straight, looking pretty good. What to do with these? Do this with me. Up in the air and then let them fall forward. But more importantly, up in the air and then let them drop back. Everyone just grew, yeah. Seven vertebrae in the neck. The head floats on top, yes. Good. Now last, what to do with these, right? So trust me on this one. Up in the air and let them relax. Wonderful. They stay attached. <laughs> Please be seated. Yes. But what do we do? Some of us protect this way and some of us protect this way. We often are gendered about what we choose to defend here. And I call this the flapping fig leaf. And so and furthermore, and while we're at it, no self-touch in public. Where you touch on your own is yours. Where you start touching around here is everybody else's. I was videotaping someone, and he got to a certain point, and we were doing it in front of a small group, and he grabbed his butt with two hands, right? And I didn't say anything, but one of the other members of the group said, you grabbed your butt. And he said, oh, no, I would never grab my butt. That's crazy. Well, now I'm watching the replay of the video with him. We're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. And we get to the butt grab. And it's very obvious. And he's, oh, oh, now I remember. I was searching for my wallet. I thought, with both hands in the middle of a presentation? <laughs> yeah. So no self-touch in public. OK, seated very quickly. What you want to do, I've never been to a chiropractor. And I apologize if not everyone can see me. I'll move this as close to the edge as I feel like I don't endanger myself or make you all uncomfortable that I will fall over. So uh, I've never been to a chiropractor, but chiropractors have been to see my presentations. And they tell me that feet flat on the floor is the best for our backs anyway. And if you're in a chair, and we often are with Zoom, the bottom of the back against the bottom of the chair, and that puts me slightly forward. Not hunched, but not the old William F. Buckley come to me. <laughs> I saw two episodes of Fire in Line being filmed, and he had a chair that truly tilted back so he could have that arrogant chin in the air. Sometimes, some of us cross our legs like this. I'm going to use you. You don't need to do anything but be the person I'm talking to. So right now, I'm fully engaged this way. As soon as I do this, I'm skewed. I'm no longer facing front. I'm taking up less space. Now, space use is gendered. We all know the expression in the subway of man spreading. It's cultural. I had a student from Korea who came to me. She spent her first eight years in Korea. Her family moved to the US. And she came to see me during office hours. And she said, Barbara, I don't feel at home in either country. I said, talk more about that. And she said, well, when I'm in the US, people say, where are you from? And I smile and say, Minnesota. And you, some of you sadly have heard the next question, where are you really from? At any rate, but I'd heard that one. But I said, well, you know, you're in Korea every summer. Her parents spoke Korean at home. She visited her grandparents every summer. How did they know that you are not living there? She said, simple, I take up too much space on public transportation. So space is also cultural. But this is not what you want to do. I call it the hoo-hoo. How little space can I possibly occupy? Sometimes people will do the leg across the lap. Now, 
please be sensitive. In some cultures, the bottom of the shoe is the most profane thing you can flash at someone. So, and even if it's not that, take off the sticky thing that says you got it on sale or <laughs> there's gum or a hole, that kind of thing. And I also don't do this very often because I have a good friend who's an anthropologist who says in, anthropolo in anthropological research, they call this the crotch display. I'll let you decide if that's the message that you want to give. So I generally stand because I have better vocal support. More people can see me and hear me. And so in general, I will so-called stand to deliver. So let's talk about how we sound, because how we sound to a large extent is our choice. And so the first thing I want to talk about are what are called vocal non-fluencies. They, they vary from culture to culture. In the US, they're usually um or uh. And in Canada, they're a little bit different. And other places, they're M. And in Ireland, it's more of an M. And so they vary. So what's the reason we want to get rid of them? There are several. The first is that they're distracting. I can't account for anyone's individual experience. But for me, it was my college chem professor, who I'm so often not proud of this. We took turns counting. It's a bad day, you know, three minutes in, and we're at 75 ums. We never learned the chemistry. Number two, it makes us seem less knowledgeable. Well, what are the most fig recent figures here? Um, uh, uh, don't really know, huh? Number three, if that's not bad enough, perhaps more pernicious, it can make it seem as if I'm fabricating the answer. Doctor, what are my most recent test results? Um, that bad, huh? Mom, dad, dad, dad? Did you do drugs in college? Um, yeah, you're going to tell me. And there is a fourth reason. We are all talking to people internationally. I do know that there is at least one person here of Turkish descent. And there is a word very close to that word of um that you never, ever want to utter. Let us just say it is vile, it is anti-woman, and it is close enough that you want to be careful. That's the one reason that really got me to get rid of that. I was speaking at a, in, in the University of Southern Europe, and I said to the group, let's talk about the ums and all the Turkish students, anything but that. So please be careful. I'll just leave you with that. What you can do is pause. If you're an ummer, think about when you do it. Most people do it between ideas rather than within ideas. We use it as a filler. Learn to hold the pause. It can be powerful. And a pause emphasizes what came before and what comes after. So don't think of a pause as absence. Think of it as presence, please. Also, up speak, where I make a statement I know it to be true, but I want your approval just in case. What's your name, Barbara Tannenbaum? Is that all right with you? If not, I'll change it. Yeah? <laughs> you laugh. My in-laws uh, thought it was a good idea. Hmm. Oh, dear. At any rate, <laughs> yes, um, so if you are an up speaker, where everything, in sound, instead of sounding certain, starts sounding like you're always looking for that approval, or I'm not sure if you know what I'm talking about. Are you agreeing with me? Sometimes I'll do it with right or OK. So I have two, I love to make up hacks. I have two hacks for this. If you're an off speaker, the first one is think exclamation point rather than question mark. My name is Barbara Tannenbaum, exclamation point. I live in Providence, Rhode Island, exclamation point. Not I live in Providence, Rhode Island, like maybe you've heard of Rhode Island. The second one, and here I truly hope not to, I say be inclusive, and then I might offend some of you, so I hope I don't, but here it goes. I'm not thinking of this as sacrilegious. I'm thinking of it as that cartoon, D-A-M-M-I-T. But I think if I say, my name is Barbara Tannenbaum, I say to myself, damn it. It gives it exactly the right cadence. <laughs> Where are you from? Providence, Rhode Island. Just don't let the damn it out. <laughs> now. I had one young man who, well, the class is for seniors. There is a long wait list to get in still. And after he left the class, he graduated that spring after he took the class, he went to work in the then governor's office. And I ran into him and said, hi, Kurt, how are you doing? Oh, fine, Barbara, I finally learned how to say my name without going up at the end. I said, Kurt, that's great. He said, let me tell you how I did it. I said, I don't even care, Kurt, that's wonderful. <laughs> let me tell you, I, OK. Now, I could never make this up. So he told me, before he says his own name out loud, when someone says, what's your name, he says to himself, so no one can hear it. 
my name is Barbara Tannenbaum. Then he says his own name out loud. If it works for you. No, really, I could not come up with this in any way. It, really. At any rate, okay, down with up speak. Pauses. We talked about pace. You want to vary your pace. Most people in the U.S. speak at a rate of about 150 to 180 words per minute. There are lots of tests now on the internet that you can look at and, and time yourself. JFK, when he was president, was timed with spurts of 300 words a minute. No one could listen to that for very long. And if I'm too slow, what you want is variety so that it picks up speed and then it emphasizes by slowing down. And volume is the same thing. If I'm always at this volume, it's like sending a, 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 a message that's all in caps. Yes, we don't like that, it's shouting. So, and if I'm very quiet, you will lean in as you're doing right now, but after about five minutes of leaning in, it's like, could you just speak a little louder and not force me to pay such careful attention? And lastly, words that I call power zappers. So I made a list of them for you, and they're here, I would say, to start with your email, because it's much easier to edit email than it is initially when you're talking. So here are some of the power zappers. My least favorite word in the English language, four letters begins with a J, J-U-S-T. I just think. I allow just as a timed reference. I just came from the university, tells you time. It just, I just, I just think. Even I think. I, full disclosure, work with politicians. Would you vote for someone, I say to them, who says, I think I have a plan for the economy. <laughs> I believe I have a plan for education. I hope I have a plan. No, I have a plan. Plans change. Some succeed, some fail. I have a plan. I think, I just think, I believe, I hope. It's only my opinion, but, oh, well, please let me not take it seriously. Try to. I don't want to hire people who are trying. I want to hire people who are doing. And if you can't say we're doing it, we plan to do it, or our plan is, rather than we're trying to. It sounds like my fingers are crossed and I'm praying. You know, my parents broke me of you know at an early age when they'd say, no, Bobby, we don't know. And if we do know, why are you telling us? Hated it then, grateful now. Actually and basically, actually, tell me nothing. And actually can sound rather sarcastic. Well, actually, like, <laughs> no. So I will admit that one of my clients is Microsoft. And many years ago, the New York Times did an article on the overuse of the word so at Microsoft. I'm still working with them on that. But then they have me trying to teach the, them how to sell Bing. That's a whole other thing, right? Yeah, no, I kept telling them until Bing is a verb, we're in trouble. Okay, like, this generation is the like generation. Like, 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 it's not like anything it is. Kinda, sorta, reduces the power. Literally, is almost literally always misused. To be honest, scares the heck out of me. If this is the honest part, what's the rest? <laughs> and very, really pretty weak modifiers. Someone said recently, this is pretty important. Important adds value, pretty takes it away. Really, what a, this is really, really important. Okay, but tomorrow you say this is important, but is it really, really? I don't know your scale. But better to do it by pausing, maybe lowering my pitch, not so I'll sound more like any particular kind of person, but as we age, many of us need glasses, there's concomitant hearing loss. Most of that is in the upper ranges first. I have been told by older men after a panel, you were the only woman on the panel I could hear. It doesn't matter how good my argument is if no one can hear it. So I pause, I lower my voice, maybe I make eye contact, maybe a gesture, and I might say, this is important. Rather than, this is really, really important. Or use a stronger word, this is critical. Critical is like unique. It does not get modified. This is really critical, someone said the other day. I said, I died twice? Like, what is this? <laughs> this is really unique. Unique means one. How do you count? Yes? <laughs> I could say rare. So be more accurate with your language. And very quickly, I want to 
The last thing I want to talk about here is credibility and how we build credibility. What tests is the components of credibility? First one is expertise, thank God, it still matters. And I always say that expertise is made up of two sub-E's, if you will, education and experience. And increasingly now we're going for experience. If I want to hire a doctor for a particular surgery, rather than where the doctor went to medical school, how many times that doctor had successfully performed that same surgery over the past two years. It used to be when you went to a lawyer or a doctor's office, all you saw were diplomas. We don't see that so much anymore. Secondly, trustworthiness. In this day and age, what gets people to trust us? Number one, I said someone else can confer their trustworthiness onto you. Number two, in this particular culture, eye contact is one of the ways that people often in interpret who is trustworthy. If I am not making eye contact, sometimes people will put on me that, that I'm trying to hide something. This does not account in any way for neurodiversity, and we could have a whole conversation about that, and I hope that we would. If anyone wants a very short introduction to the issue of communication and neurodiversity, it's, it's a YouTube, and the person is, they are Mel, M-E-L, Baggs, B-A-G-G-S. Mel sadly died during COVID, of COVID, but Mel Baggs. The, it's about a nine minute video and it will change the way you think about neurodiversity and communication. But taking up space and confidence inspires trust. And there was one study that said even 10 ums in a presentation starts leeching that trustworthiness. So these are things that we do have control over. We might not have control over the biases that people have, but we know that there is a bias um, or, um, uh, against those kinds of things, and we can all decide to get rid of that. So trustworthiness, showing that my prior record. In the past, I predicted X, and that was an X came to pass. Now I'm going to predict X prime. Similarity is important too. What do you and I have in common that allows you to believe that I understand you well enough to give you the information that I'm giving you? So before I mentioned that I was the shy, quiet kid, and there are some of you, I'm sure, who fell into that category. And so you think, okay, if she can now speak with confidence, maybe I can do it too. So it's, we like common ground if we build it. Dynamism is different. It's called an amplifier variable. What do I mean by that? If you think I know what I'm talking about, you trust me, and you've had some similarities with me, and I come out with a lot of energy, more power than ever. However, you think I don't know what I'm talking about, you don't trust me, and there's no common ground, and I come out with dynamism, it makes it more negative. So this is what we're facing, yes, as a, as a not just a country, but as a world right now, is that everybody is trying to hype up the dynamism and hasn't established all of those other things with each other to go cross audience in some ways. The last one, likability. We are more persuaded by people whom we like. So how, who do we like? How, or how do we get to be likable? Similarity makes us likable. We like people who are like us. This is why it's so hard to get DEI, right? Because we're comfortable with people who are like us, we hire people who are like us, and then it doesn't change at the top. So we could have a longer discussion there too. We like being listened to. And so if I say to my server, I want a, uh, a turkey sandwich, whole wheat bread, lettuce and tomato, spicy mustard, hold the mayo. The best thing that server can do to increase their tip is to repeat back. So you want a turkey sandwich, whole wheat, lettuce and tomato, spicy mustard, hold the mayo. And if they do, there's one study that said tips can rise up to 77.0%. We like being listened to and we like being heard. We like genuine compliments. This is the best looking audience I've ever seen. Not so genuine, yeah? But I was heartfelt when I said the people I, I talked to last night were also bright and engaged and seemed to know each other and care about each other. It was something that I certainly felt. And lastly, we like other people who like us. 
So find something to like in your audience. It will help. I know we're just about at time. Do we have time for one question, maybe? OK. And, and I will be around right after the talk. Sometimes people have questions they don't like to lob out in front of the whole group. I will say this about questions, that questions should always be encouraged. The presentation is what I think you want to know. Questions tell me what you want to know. So they should always be encouraged. The worst thing is you don't get any questions. You leave the meeting, and then everyone else argues against it, and you've never had a chance to defend it because no one's even asked you a question. So any questions? I've scared you all about communication. Yes, please. Do you have any tips for speakers for whom English is a second language? OK. Any tips for anyone for whom English is a second language? And I have, a, I have a, an extra advantage here in that we talked last night. I think often we worry about it and we don't need to. So I would record myself and listen because our fear is almost always much worse than it is. The second thing I would say is English is a slow language. Many people who speak English as a second language try and speak it as quickly as they speak their native tongue. And it's too fast. We just don't get it. English is a very discrete language. Our syllables don't blend into each other. They, wait, they might do in French or another language. So take your time, speak slowly. Uh, the other thing, there are two other things that I would think of that might be helpful in thinking about that question. One is that the studies that I've read says it takes an audience about 90 seconds to acculturate to a strong accent. So I wouldn't put the most important information in the first minute. I would wait. Sometimes people want to know where you're from or they're trying to place the accent so they get distracted by that, distracted by that too. Number two, and this is certainly personal choice. It's really up to you if you have a strong accent. But often, if you have a strong accent, you don't necessarily want a lot of facial hair. Because if there's ambiguity in what you're saying, I'm going to try to read your lips a little bit to understand that ambiguity. And with a lot of facial hair, that just makes it more of an obstacle. Again, that's your choice. And maybe that's the best way to bring things to a close. Today, I outlined some choices we might all make about our communication about making it more direct, making it more powerful. I often talk about making it more persuasive. If I'm ever invited back, we'll talk about the persuasive and persuasion piece. But know that we all have control over how we are perceived, at least to some extent. We can't all overcome bias and those kinds of things, although we'll keep pushing to change it. But what I can say is that we need your voices the voices of people who care. I got, heard conversations last night about open source, about things that are so important for us all to be thinking and talking about, that if you can take your knowledge and amplify it, because good communication produces good results, then we will all be better off. So thank you all for your energy, for the work that you do, and I will be outside to answer any further questions. <laughs>